the name of Jesus once again. Friends and families all over the world, welcome to church. This is Church of Heroes Mart. I want to thank you for calling in. Please bring your faith and bring your expectations to the table, to the technology that we have right now to beam this webcast all over the world. Yoke your faith together with us so we can have a good time together in the presence of the Lord because every joint is going to supply. Hallelujah. Here is Mod is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations in keeping with the instruction of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, which says, Go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you to do. And the Lord will be with you till the end of the age. And in trying to keep this instruction, this ministry, God's given us the privilege to create a resource through which we can do that very well. That resource we've titled the Online Discipleship Program, or the ODP in short. And now the ODP is a set of studies from the Word of God, which may be sectioned into five major categories. The pharmacy section of the Word, the milk section of the Word, the meat section of the Word, the water section of the Word, and combination meals. And in trying to keep this instruction, this ministry going through the 2021 session of the ODP, we've come through the pharmacy aspect of it. We are right now in the milk category of the Word of God, and it's been fun so far. And we are going to try to further the milk section of the Word of God today. And I'm going to ask you, please go ahead and turn to the book of Hebrews, which gives us a catalog of certain concepts of the Word of God that will pass as the milk aspect of the Word. Hallelujah. So please go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hallelujah. In verse 11, it says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. And anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching of our righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings of our Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. In our faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitted, we will do so. And in coming through the 2021 session of the Milk of the Word, we've come through repentance from dead works, we've come through faith toward God, instruction about baptisms, and we started laying on of hands last week, and we are going to try to wrap it up today by the grace of God. So today we are going to be talking about laying on of hands, part two. Hallelujah. We started talking about the concept of laying on of hands last week to broach the idea of how there are several avenues through which spiritual energies may be transferred to an external agent via physical contact. You can transfer spiritual energy by laying hands on people. You can transfer spiritual energy by speaking words over people. You can transfer spiritual energy by even thinking about somebody. You can transfer spiritual energy by taking anchorages from your body and placing their bodies. All these are different ways that people who have lived before us, transferred spiritual energy. We can see this in the Old Testament, the case of Elijah, the case of Elisha. We can see that in the ministry of Jesus. We see that in the ministry of Paul. And all through the pages of the Bible, we can see how spiritual energies were transferred to external parties via these different avenues that we started talking about last week. And we know that over there, that there are two major categories of spiritual energies. There is positive spiritual energy and there is negative spiritual energies. 
So they just like positive spiritual energies may be transferred via physical contact, laying hands or speaking words or thinking about people or contacting physical objects. In the same way, negative spiritual energy may be transferred by laying hands on people, speaking words to people, even thinking about people. You can transfer negative spiritual forces like that. And it behooves us in this generation, and especially for anybody who's going to be interested in being a part of the man-child company, who will do the greater works of Jesus, documented in John chapter 14, verse 12, which says, the works that I do, you shall do also. It behooves us to understand what Yahushua, Yahushua understood to be able to do those greater works. And one of those critical understandings that Jesus had was a very firm understanding of spiritual energies. How you can transfer spiritual energies, how you can conserve spiritual energy, how not to waste spiritual energy, which is what we are going to delve deeper into today by the grace of God. In other words, we're going to be talking about the concept of spiritual energy, not necessarily from the standpoint of the recipient of spiritual energy, we're going to be talking about the concept of spiritual energy right now from the standpoint, for the most part, of the person who is going to be able to transfer spiritual energy to other people. Hallelujah. The body of Christ, for the most part, <laughs> especially in the Western community, because they don't want to grow up, just unfortunately, they have resigned themselves to people coming over and pray for me. Oh, just come pray for me, come pray for me. They got a bunch of prayer contractors and say, "Yeah, they're coming over. Let them. Why don't you be the person who's going to be praying for the people? <laughs> Why don't you be the person who's going to be laying hands on people? No, no, no. I just want people to lay hands on me. Come lay hands on me. Well, that's fine and that's good if you're a baby. But there's going to come a time when all the people are going to lay hands on you. They're going to pray over you, and nothing's going to happen. Why? Because God's expecting you to grow right now. You've got to be an agent of virtue." You go learn how to be an agent of spiritual energy, and positive spiritual energy, <laughs> and maybe other parts of the world are like that. But that's my exposure for the most part. In um, other parts of the world, people don't have as many prayer contractors as they have over the over here in, in this part of the world. But regardless, but you got to understand that God is going to be interested in you being an agent of spiritual energy as well. Learning how to transfer spiritual energy to other parties. And that's what this part two of laying on of hands is going to try to delve deeper into today. So we are going to be talking about the concept of, of, of spiritual energy and how to, how to carry it, how to transfer it. But firstly, we've got to understand that there are different resources on the believer, just like there are different resources on the master. Well, how do we know that? Well, turn to the book of John to start with. You are going to see that Yahushua carried at least two resources, which we know he carried more than two resources. I'm going to show you um, all the scriptures. But just, just to get, get started with that, look, look at John in John chapter 3. I'm going to tell you that Jesus had at least three, two resources on it. <laughs> and I know he carried more than that. Hallelujah. John chapter 3 and in verse 34. It says, For the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God. For God gives the Spirit without measure. That's what King James actually calls it. Give the Spirit without limit. So Jesus, this is, this is uh, talking about Jesus over here, says Yahushua carries a certain spirit without measure. Now we know that, that's talking figuratively with regards to the spirit being the Holy Spirit that he can pour like a fluid. He is a person. It's not necessary that the Holy Spirit is a fluid, but he pours some kind of spiritual resource on Jesus that is without measure. And that's real. There is a substance on the master which is almost limitless. What you can call without measure. Now, which scripture supports that? If you turn to the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1, you are going to see that John chapter 3, verse 34, is pretty accurate. Because, because that understanding is consistent with other parts of scripture, just like Hebrews chapter 1, which I'm going to read to you right now. In Hebrews chapter 1 and in verse 9, talking about Jesus, 
And I just going to read from verse 8. This is, but about the song he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So the anointing of Jesus uh, was anointed with over there when it was here over 2,000 years ago, surpassed the anointing that Elijah had, that Moses had, that any other patriarch of the Old Testament had back in the Old Testament. Yahushua was anointed more than anybody else. And of course, if you read from the page of the Bible, you'll know, understand well, Yahushua, the master. The way he operated absolutely surpassed the way anybody else would live before him operated. There's got to be certain kind, kind of resources on him, a resource on him that position him to do that. Hallelujah. And for your information, <laughs> Jesus now says in John chapter 14 that sufficient for a servant is to become like his master. And then he says that the works that I do, you are going to do also in greater works than these you are going to do. So if the anointing, the spirit without measure that Jesus had positioned him to be truly greater than all the patriarchs that leave the Old Testament. And he says, I'm giving you a promise right now that you are going to do more than I did. Then the least we can believe is that we are going to need that same resource on us so we can do the greater works of Jesus. And the fact that we're doing the greater works of Jesus does not mean that we are going to, going to be greater than the master. Because the Bible says the servant is not going to be better or greater than his master. He can attain to the spiritual capacity of his master, but he's not going to get any better. And that's fine. Why do you want to get better than Jesus to start with? And for your information... Actually, he's the Lord, and you are just a small Lord under him. You are just a small G on the big G, God. I don't want to be bad than the master. I just want to do the works of the master. Why? Because we do the works of the master to give the Father a harvest of righteousness. So Yahushua is not giving us this promise in John chapter 14 and verse 12, which I'm going to read to you, just because... He is wanting us to be pompous about it. No, he's giving us this promise because the promise is going to be tied to get together to a grand purpose, to a grand objective of giving the Father a harvest of righteousness. Now let's look at that promise in John chapter 14. I tell you the truth, this is verse 12 right now of John chapter 14, the, the, the truth, anyone who has faith in me, will do what I have been doing, and he will do even greater, th greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Wow. Can you see that from the pages of your Bible? It says you are going to do the works of Jesus, and even greater works than the works. Wow. I can't believe it. Well, you better believe it, because it's in your Bible. But we're not even doing it. A quarter of the works of Jesus, so maybe like a tenth, 0.0001% of the works. We haven't seen that before. Well, I know. Now, do you think this promise is going to come to pass? I believe, yes, it will. How will it come to pass when we learn everything that Jesus learned? Well, you mean Jesus learned? Of course he learned. The Word of God says that he grew in wisdom and stature. Look at Luke, Luke chapter 2 over there. He developed in wisdom and stature. So the reason we can't do the works of Jesus is because we don't know what Yahushua knew when it was here 2,000 years ago. And evidently, because he even told his disciples, he says, well, I've got a lot of things to talk about. But I can't talk about all of them right now because you can't bear them. Well, the same thing is going to be applicable to our generation over there. There's lots of things to talk about, but we're just stunted in our growth. There is pride and arrogance in our hearts. There's dishonesty over there. There's competition, all this kind of madness from hell. In our hearts, strong gods and traditions of man which will clutter our understanding to be able to work and walk in the fullness of the power of the Spirit without measure. But well, bless the name of Jesus, the seal for season that we are entering into was designed to cut all those nonsense out of our hearts so that the body of the Messiah may truly be clothed with the Spirit without measure and then do the works of Jesus. 
But the reason I'm talking about this is for you to understand that Yahushua carried a certain resource on it that you can call the spirit without measure, the spirit without limit, the anointing upon, which we call in this ministry righteousness cushion, or an open door resource, which traces back to the tabernacle of Moses as well, how the high priest and the, the high priest is going to be anointed with certain, uh, with, the, with, the, with the oil that has certain formulas on it. Uh, he had the formula of Calabas and Casey. And all these things you're going to see in Exodus chapter 30. But all those things to symbolize the crown of life that you are going to get as you pass the Father's fire tests, which will give you an open door resource so that before you say something, something is going to happen over there. You're not going to need to pray like 24 hours before you can you can shake that 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 tree over there. It's going to say something like that. Something's going to, that resource was on Yahushua. And that resource needs to grow on you as well. And actually, you have some of it already if you belong to Jesus. Because the Word of God says, you're going to lay your hands on the sick, the sick shall recover. With same hands laid on people, the sick will recover in rightness. So you got some anointing on you. It's not going to be completely accurate to say that you don't have an anointing at all. No, you have an anointing right now. There is some oil on you to start with, by the grace of God. But the oil on you needs to grow to the measure described in John chapter 3 and verse 34. So if you've got a paper copy of the Bible over there, John chapter 3 and verse 34, you can write over there unlimited resource on Yahushua. Bookmark that. Number one resource. Hallelujah. But then in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 7 especially, Jesus was talking to the Canaanite woman who brought her daughter over for Jesus to heal her daughter. And Yahushua describes the concept of a limited resource. Let's look at it. Mark chapter 7 and verse 24. Yahushua left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it is right, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it over to their dog. Look at that. Yahushua tells this woman over there, the resource I have on me right now is limited. Really? That's what he said. He says, I got something on me and it is limited. I, I, it's not going to be appropriate for me right now to send this resource over to you because you're a Greek, you're a Gentile. And I can't send this resource over to you right now because the resource I... I'm conserving it for my children, the nation of Israel. She, he knew that. But the woman, you know, you know, she, she wouldn't give up. She said, yes, Lord, she replied. But even the dogs under the table eat the children's crops. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter right now. So she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon got from her. So it means to curtail the axis of the demonic, you need a certain limited resource that was on Yahushua. Well, but I thought Jesus had a spirit without measure. Well, correct. But over here he describes the spirit with measure. So what's the difference? It means that there are different resources on the master. There is a limited resource on Jesus, which we know here in Mark chapter 7 is talking about incense. So what happens says Jesus is going to pray every morning, the effectual firm prayer of a righteous man. It's going to make power available, which is dynamic and it's working. That power is responsible for curtailing the excesses of the demonic. That power is responsible for creating miracles on the outside. But that power is a limited resource and it is a finite resource, which means that once you use it, you will have to replenish it. Now, Jesus has done all the spiritual activities in the morning, like praying the kingdom through and all the things we talk about in this ministry. And he's placed a certain resource on his physical body. And he's very spiritually intelligent. He monitors the content of his physical body. How much incense is here to do this kind of work? And what do I need to do? And he monitors that all day long. 
And here comes this woman and says, well, I need something. I need some of your resources. And this woman is a study over there. I don't know who taught her that, that there is a limited resource on the master. And she understands that what I need actually just a crumb of it. I don't need too many of it. I don't need too much of it. Just give me some crumbs of it and my daughter is going to be healed. And she didn't have access to the scrolls of the scriptures. She didn't have access to the synagogue because she was a Greek over there. They wouldn't let her in over there. The Pharisees didn't even know that much. So there is a limited resource to cast out devils and do cures on that. But she knew something like that. Well, we know how she 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 got that understanding through HHF. We did all that study in the Overcomer Secret, the pharmacy section of the word. But the reason I'm bringing the scripture out in here is to <laughs> create in your mind an understanding of another resource that was present on the master, which we can call a limited resource, which works in conjunction, actually, which leverages the platform of an unlimited resource to do the kind of works that Jesus did. So we read in John chapter 14, verse 12, that the works I do, you're going to do also. Well, how did Jesus do his works? Can you trace the works right now to this limited resource and unlimited resource that we read over there in John chapter 3? Two resources of the master. Well, how do you know that this finite resource, this incense over there, is going to be what Jesus did in a mode of prayer? Now, keep reading it and read straight into verse 31 of Mark chapter 7. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. And there some people brought him, brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hand on the man. And after he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he speak, and he taught the man's talk. Nothing happened. Put his finger over there. Speak and talk the man's talk. Nothing happened. Then he looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said, F father, which means be open. And at this, the man's ears were open. His tongue was loosened, and he began to speak, speak plainly. Now think a little bit. Why did Yahushua have to do a deep sigh in the heaven? In other instances of the word, in lots of places, you're going to see Jesus is just going to be, be healed over there. Why not deep sigh in the heaven? Now, the book of Mark just captured that as a deep sigh in heaven, but we know, studying through the lifestyle of Jesus, Hebrews 5, 7 and all of that, we know what he was trying to do was he made supplication and travail a little bit. And we know that in the mode of supplication and travail, based on James chapter 5 and verse 16, that's how effectual, effectual firm and prayer of righteousness is going to make incense available. So what Yahushua was doing over there was to pump incense from his spirit on his body so he could heal that guy. How come? I thought he pumped incense in the morning. Correct, he did that. But this woman that we read in the prior story had depleted incense on his body. Can you see right? So Yahushua had a reservoir of incense, which is going to be zoe gas on his body, which he pumped in the morning, put it on his body. But this woman over there taking, taking some of it. And Yahushua told her before, there's not going to be enough power for me to heal the people of Israel right now. I can't give it to you. But the woman kept on pressing, said, Lord, come on, help me. Please help me. And Yahushua, well, okay, well, you, you got to help me because you have faith right now, man. This is, the, this is the kind of people that God's looking for. Come on, go ahead and just have it. But Yahushua was low on incense on his body right now. He had to replenish that incense to heal this other person who was deaf and mute. A mute man who couldn't talk. He placed his hand over there. He laid hands on it. The deaf man wasn't healed. Then he did a little sigh to heaven over there. Deep sigh in heaven. What did he do? Just pumped out incense a little bit in less than 30 seconds. Because of a high righteousness caution, he could download incense to his body right now. Then he said, F father, be healed. Come on. Talk to God. And something happened over there that the man was healed instantly. So if you read in between all those lines of the scriptures, these are the kind of questions you should be asking. 
Peter, James, and John were not inquisitive enough to ask Jesus these questions over there. Because if they asked him, he would have told them. If they went and got back into the house, they should have, Peter should have said, Hey, Master, why, why did he do that deep side in heaven? Like, Come on, what's going on over there? He would have broken it down for them. He would have told them, Well, this woman stole a couple of crumbs <laughs> legitimately, but I've got to pull those crumbs back in my body right now for the nation of Israel because I was sent over to them. If I just lay hands on that man over there without incense, nothing is going to happen. Guys, you got to believe this. Two resources on the master. A limited resource, a finite resource, which you can call Zoe incense on, on his body. And a spirit without measure, which you can call the anointing upon, or righteousness quotient, an open door resource on Yahushua's body, which we read over there in John chapter 3, verse 34. And you're going to understand how to monitor, how to grow, how to conserve, and how to, how not to waste all those resources. Now, those resources were in Yahushua's body. When it was here over 2,000 years ago, and by extension, the 21st century believer has access to these resources as well. But you've got to grow your understanding to be just as intelligent as Jesus was to understand what the resources are, why they are given, how to grow them on you, how to monitor your resources. How to know if resources are low. How to conserve the resources. How not to waste those resources. And that's the reason for this message by the grace of God, which is laid on of hands part two, spiritual economics. That's what we're going to call this message today by the grace of God, spiritual economics. And in studying in study in different portions of the Bible, I've come across at least five resources which the believer of the New Testament has access to. Well, you're going to see a chart on the board right, right there. It's a table that breaks it down for you, but I'm just going to run through it um, in a catalog fashion. Well, there is Zoe water, which is the fundamental particle which created everything. Zoe water, the Word of God says, the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the surface of the waters in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1 and verse 2 over there. And then the Lord said, let there be and there was. So don't you think that the, the, the waters that the Spirit of the Lord was generating will be significant, and they are, actually, to God's creation and recreation of the universe, of course. If you flip over to Revelation chapter 22, you are going to see there's something like waters over there as well. This is I see flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, water as brightly, brightly clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Zoe water, fundamental particle. Now the Spirit of the Lord in Revelation chapter 18, I believe chapter 22, says over there, Come, let him who is thirsty come and drink of this water. So it means that you have access if you're thirsty. And don't you think that's going to be important for you as well, to, to remain thirsty for Zoe water? We're going to talk to that. Well, now, fundamentally, there is Zoe water. It looks like water. Well, but I can't see it. Well, it's spiritual water. I'm not talking about natural water right now. Even though it looks like natural water, your eyes can't see it because it is spiritual. And you have access to it. Your recreated human spirit has access to it. If you are born again, if you call Jesus, Yahushua, the Messiah, Lord, and Savior, you have access to it. Zoe water. But in addition to Zoe water, there is another resource that you have access to. That's called Zoe spices. Zoe water is not a set of Zoe spices. Zoe spices will be the powder form of the life of God which your spirit has access to if you are vitally connected to divine Yahushua. What does that mean? We talked about that in baptism into the Messiah. What he means is if you yoke yourself together with Jesus' ministry, you start to think about Yahushua's ministry. You make your plans based on Yahushua's ministry right now, the vision of Yahushua's company. You have Zoe Pisces in you. Now, if you don't make your plans, if you, if you are not baptized into Yahushua actively, you may have Zoe water in you, but you are low on spices, my brother, my sister. And that's the reason you're going to pray, and your prayer 
who will know the answer probably. Why? Because it's coming with the wrong formula. So you got to understand that Zohar Spice is really important. Another resource that you have that a believer has access to is Zoe Oil Within. Why are we calling all these resources Zoe something, Zoe something? Well, the Greeks came up with our word Zoe to describe the concept of the life of God. And I want to give them credit for it, and that's really good. But there are different forms of the life of God. The understanding of the life of God being a spiritual substance has been in the earth's atmosphere for over a hundred years ago. But the body of Christ hasn't done a good job at deepening that understanding and adding additional details to that understanding. Well, the life of God is the nature of God. The life of God is the spiritual substance that makes God God. And guess what? You have access to the life of God. So way you're the life of God. And we, we just tick off running around the church building because of that little revelation over there. Come on. Well, we thank God for that revelation, but what are the different forms of that Zoe? How do we get access to more of it? How does one form morph to another form? How can I monitor my access to it? You ask the body of Christ right now, they could just give a looking at you like, why don't rise over there? They don't know anything going on. What's going on with you? got deeper that understanding. It's good to know that Zoe is a spiritual substance but it is important to deepen that understanding to know the different forms of Zoe. That's the reason for this message. And actually, we started talking about it. In faith toward God for the power of life. If you remember that from the study of faith principles. Well, there is Zoe oil within. The word of God says the anointing you have received from him remains in you to teach you all things. So there is oil within you to teach you something. And we can see that from the tabernacle of Moses as well. There is oil that they used to put in the menorah to give illumination to the holy place. So you can journey to or the most holy place to download a counsel from the Lord. So it means there's got to be some kind of resource in you, within the believer. Zoe oil. How do you get access to that resource? How do you monitor that resource? How do you know when it's getting low? Stay on board. I'm going to show you. Well, what about Zoe incense? Zoe incense is what I described based on the story in Mark chapter 7 which is the gaseous form of the life of God. It is what you generate. It is gas. This time around is not a liquid. It's not a solid. It's not a liquid like water. It's not oil. It is gas. Literally gas. When you, when you push out power in the place of prayer, especially through travail, you put some certain gas, gases on you. Hallelujah. It's not flatulence. It is gas. We call it spiritual gas. And it smells really well. Hallelujah. And when you go around right there's all kind of gases on your body. When the devil sees that, it's going to check off. Somebody taps into that gas by faith. It's going to flow by believing the words of your mouth. And by touching the skin, it's called Zoe incense. And we can see that as well in the tabernacle of Moses. How the priest every morning will swing gas to our most of the place to obtain access to the council of the Lord. You have something like that to the New Testament. And that's the reason the book, of, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 8, is going to say the prayers of the saints of God rise up like incense before the Lord. Revelation 5, 8, Revelation 8, over there, talk about that. There is Zoe incense. And he is a derivative of Zoe water. And then there is Zoe oil upon, which is going to be the anointing upon, which can grow to the kind of resource that Jesus had on him. And John chapter 3 and verse 34, which the book of Hebrews talks about. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9 that we just read over there, which is a quotation from the book of Psalms, the Messianic Psalm that talked about how Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And that talked about how Jesus was anointed beyond um, his companions because he loved righteousness and hid iniquity. Thou hast loved righteousness and hid iniquity. Therefore God anointed you with all of, all of gladness above your fellows. There was an oil, there was oil on Jesus that is different from the oil within Jesus. The same thing with you if you belong to Yahushua. There is Zoe upon. So reading through the Bible, we can see all these different forms, all these different forms of the life of God. Zoe water, Zoe spices, Zoe oil within, Zoe incense, Zoe oil upon. And these virtues are all important. You've got to learn how to conserve all these virtues, all these forms of spiritual energies 
with the concept of spiritual economics, which the master teaches us. And that's the reason for this message by the grace of God. So study along with us. So we talked about all these resources, and you are going to see a chart on the board right now that talks about all these different resources over there. First resource is Zoe Water, which Jesus says that those who believe on him will have access to. Uh, hallelujah. Let's turn to John chapter 7 to see that. John chapter 7 and verse 37. Um, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. It says, if you're thirsty, Come and drink, and out of your belly streams of living waters will flow. Wow. So means that there's water within your belly. That's correct. Oh, wow. How do I know that? Now turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22, to see what that water looks like. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city and on each side of the rivers to the tree of life. So there is water flowing from God, but He didn't tell you where it's flowing to. It's flowing to your spirit and everybody else connected to God who is in submission to the Lord. Zoe water flowing into you. Now, Revelation chapter 22 and in verse 17. Now says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hear, hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. So there is an invitation to you. If you belong to Jesus, come take this water of life into your spirit. That's why we know there is a resource called Zoe Water. What type of resource it is? It is internal it is a liquid, a spiritual liquid, and it is fundamental. Why? Because everything else will, walk, will work for you if Zoe water is in abundance. What's the location of this resource? The location of this resource is the recreated human spirit. Why is this resource given? We talked about that in baptism into the Holy Spirit. It is the seal and the stamp of God's ownership on the believer. When you got baptized into the Messiah, there is a seal of the Holy Spirit over there, which is a little trickle of Zoe water to announce to all of God's creation that Mr. A or Mrs. B belong to God. But you require an overflow of it for growth and for strength, and that's what we call being enveloped with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How do you get this, this overflow? When you get the, the, the overflow by sustaining your access to the water of life by maintaining a proper right stand in relationship with God. You get the seal of the water of life by getting born again. We understand that. We talked about that. But you got to maintain a right stand in relationship with God through sustaining the status of zero treason. Through Zoe scriptures. The word of God says in Proverbs chapter 18 that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Receive revelation knowledge. Listen to the truly greater. Stay baptized into the Holy Spirit. Those are ways that you can stay full of Zoe water on the inside. Oh, well, he doesn't have to get that technical. Well, that's the reason you can't do the works of Jesus. You don't understand the works of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, you harbor treason in your heart and check if there is going to be a flow of Zoe water into your heart. Of course not. If I harbor treason in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear me. You're going to feel so dry on the inside while, because there's treason over there. You blocked something. Oh, yeah. So that understanding is important. So unclutter your right standing relationship with God. Unclutter that pipe, that conduit pipe of righteousness, so that Zoe water, the life of God, can flow into your spirit. That, that understanding is important. 
How do I monitor it? Check the joy level in your heart. Check the inner strength to resist sin. Which scripture says that? Well, let's look at Psalm 46 to start with. You ever seen the book of Psalms in Psalm 46? How the word of God says that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Psalm 46. Hallelujah. Verse 4. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. So we saw that river in Revelation chapter 22, but the scripture in Psalm 46 and verse 4 lets us know the purpose of that river. It says that river is responsible for gladness. Well, little wonder then that the Bible is going to say in Psalm 16 that in the presence of the Lord, there's the fullness of joy. When you get close to the presence of the Lord, there is nothing like a down moment over there. There's just joy all around that place. The right kind of joy. It's not the kind of joy that we are going to get over there on the side of eternity with, because, well, I got money in the bank right now, so I'm happy. No, and I'm talking about a spiritual joy, a spiritual feeling that comes on you because you know the creator of the ends of the earth is pleased with you. Glory to God. That joy is there over there. Well, that's an indication to let us know that if my joy level is low, it means the Zoe water is low over there. That's how you can monitor. The joy level on the inside is low. Well, maybe Zoe water is low. You're going to start, start asking yourself questions. What's going on over there? Is there treason in my heart? God's not pleased with something. I'm feeling dry on the inside. Spiritual intelligence. You've got to build all those things into you because Yahushua knew that very well. On the cross of Calvary, when he was hanging on the cross of Calvary, Yahushua sensed a dearth of Zoe water to his spirit. Why? Because the Father hid his face from him. Why? Because Yahushua took on our sins and guilt by faith, and Zoe water supply was cut off. Thou, I, uh, your eyes are too holy to behold iniquity. The Father hid his face from him. And Yahushua could detect that real quick. He says, God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So he knew that God is trying, what's going on over there. You be that smart as well. Lots of Christians in our generation, God has forsaken them. So, well, you don't know if God, oh, wow, but God, I'll never forsake or leave you. Can't you see the Bible says you'll never forsake, forsake or leave you. But you're feeling dry on the inside. That is a taste of being forsaken by the Lord. Not forever. If you repent, I mean, that relationship is going to be back over there. Oh, but the Bible said, you'll never forsake, forsake me. You'll never leave me out forsaken. But the Father forsook Jesus on the cross of Calvary. How much less he can forsake you if you harbor treason in your heart. Oh, but he said, you'll never forsake me or leave me. The Father will never forsake me or leave me. Okay, let's go back to that scripture. Would did Jesus write that scripture to you? Before you can apply that revelation to yourself on the side of eternity, Yahushua was writing that scripture predominantly to the disciples who didn't have treason at the back of their hearts. Now, before that scripture can be applicable to you, you've got to make sure you are like those people to whom that scripture was originally written to. You. You've got to be like the disciples with no treason. That you can say the Father will never forsake or leave me. But if you step out of your comfort zone and you start fraternizing with treason, then you're going to see that there is a distancing a little bit. God's going to distance himself away from you. You're going to start feeling dry on the inside. What's going on? Low zone and water. You've got to be able to know that. And that understanding is not a curse of the law. That understanding will position you if you know that, oh, God's not pleased with something. I'm feeling dry on the inside. Maybe God told me to do something. I'm not doing it. Oh, but I haven't committed fornication. I haven't done, done. Well, it's sin. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the violation of a commandment is what will block or truncate the supply of Zoe water to the womb of your spirit. If you have that understanding, you quickly repent of it. You're going to see that relationship is going to be restored like that. You receive forgiveness by faith. First John 1 9. You do what God's telling you to do. And here comes that freshness of Zoe water. Pew. Into your spirit. Blah, blah. blah. You're going to see. Oh, wow. This thing is real. Yeah, he works. Monitor. Monitor. 
And I don't have any trees in my heart. What's going on over there? I still have a low supply of Zoe water. Well, maybe you've neglected being baptized into the Holy Spirit a little bit. Maybe you need to go listen to the true and greater or something like that. Someone who's full of Zoe water. And actually, lots of times, it's going to be, if you feel a dearth, it's a lot, lots of times, it's going to be maybe low incense, maybe not necessarily low Zoe water. But check the first part of this chart. So that's how to do it. Check your joy level. Well, then on the scripture, to, to let you know if Zoe water is low, it's going to be Proverbs chapter 24. Let's look at that. Your ability to resist sin, your resistance to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, that inner strength is going to start getting low as well. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 10. If you falter in a time of adversity, how small is your strength? So I need some strength on the inside not to fall in a time of adversity. So I'm going to monitor that strength. A time of adversity doesn't have to be uh, supposedly something too egregious on the outside. Maybe a time of temptation in the mind. And I'm charging back against that temptation. The uh, devil is not leaving over there. Oh, there is a low supply of Zoe water. So that's how you can monitor as well. How do you grow it? Well, the way you grow it is going to be making sure you maintain your right standard relationship with the Father. Sustain the status of perfect obedience over there. Uh, staying open to revelation, listen to the truly greater, staying baptized in the Holy Spirit, and avoiding godless chatter. The Word of God says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 as well, avoid godless chatter. Why? Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6 talks about that as well. That when you go out, when you come in the house, Talk about the Lord every time. Wrap your life around the ministries of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Make sure you're thinking in His modes. Set your mind of things above. Set your affections over there. That's how Zoe water will grow on the inside of you. will keep flowing to you. All right. Second resource. Second resource is going to be spices, which are going to be used for incense. It is the sufficiency of effectuality. In incense equations that we talked about and faith toward God for the power of life. And the believer has access to something like this. How do we know that? Exodus chapter 30. Let's take a look at that real quickly. In verse 34, we're just going to touch the scripture and move on because we talked about it extensively in baptism into the Messiah. Exodus 30 and 34. Then the Lord said to Moses, take fragrant spices, gum resin, Onica, Galbena, and pure frankincense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense, the work of a perfumer. It is to be salted and pure and sacred. Grind some of it into powder and place it in front of the testimony in the tent of the mini, where I will meet with you. So there is some kind of powder over there. Well, that powder is an indication of a spiritual resource which is available in the vine for the branches that are connected to the vine. Why? Because those spices of the Old Testament are products of certain resinous trees which they used to get by squeezing the vines of certain trees over there. They're going to squeeze the vine of stacti and stacti powder or viscous food is going to flow out over there. They're going to squeeze the vine of Galbanum tree. They're going to squeeze the vine of frankincense. And coupled together with a mica, which is the shell of a mollusk, which we talked about before, and some salt, they are going to put this powder in front of the testimony. Now, John chapter 15 talks about that as well. In verse 1, to the New Testament believer, I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that he will even be more fruitful. So the branch has to be in the vine, taking spices from the vine so that the branch can have fruit on it. And those spices are not water, but they derive themselves from water. Water is going to come from the soil into the vine and into the branches. 
But in addition to water, there's got to be certain viscous fluids that will flow inside. That's what we call spices over there. What is that spice? What are those spices? It is zoe solid. It is powder. It is located inside a recruited human spirit. It is required for answered prayers to fulfill the ministries of Yahushua. How do I get access to Zoe Spices? Think about the ministries of Jesus. Stay baptized into the Messiah. Don't make your decisions by yourself anymore. Use Zoe Scriptures. Think about the ministries of the Messiah. How do I monitor? How do I know if the spices in me are getting low? Well, check your willingness to fulfill the ministries of Jesus. If I am not interested in staying baptized into the Messiah, I'm not interested in necessarily coupling my major decisions together with the decisions of Jesus, the vision of Jesus' ministry. I just want to do things my own right now. Um, after all, just a little bit of calling Jesus Lord is okay with this part. I got the education. I mean, I've got the powers to handle it. When you start thinking like that, the spices in you are going to start getting low. And you may still have Zoe water because there's really no trees in your heart, so to say. But the spices in you are going to start getting low. And when the spices get low in you, you can bear fruit over there. And over time, once you're not bearing fruit, then you can truncate your access to Zoe water. And then you're going to start having issues like that. <laughs> so it is, it is connected. You've got to make sure you check that willingness to fulfill the ministries of Jesus. How do you grow this resource? Think about the ministries of Yahushua. Stay baptized in the Messiah. Avoid godless chatter. Uh, resource number three. The oil within, which is going to be the legality aspect of effectuality, which we talked about in incense equations. 1 John chapter 2, verse 24 says, You have an anointing within that teaches you all things. What type of resource is it? It's an internal resource. And it is a liquid. It is oil. It traces itself back to the tabernacle of Moses. How they used to put pure olive oil inside the menorah. So that they could see. They could have light and illumination to journey to the most of the place. Why is this resource given? It is required for spiritual light. So that you can see clearly. If there is no light in your mind, you can't see clearly. Uh, if you want to try it, go into a dark room over there. There are lots of pieces, lots of information in your room. There is information about the sofa. There is information about the table. There is information about your phone. But if there is no light, you can see all those different pieces of information. Go check it out again. Get into your room in the middle of the night and switch all the lights. It's going to be so dark. You don't know, well, how do I get my phone? You start stumbling all around. Well, the same thing is going to be applicable with the realm things about the spirit as well. When you see that your mind is getting dark, you can't see clearly anymore. Maybe oil is getting low. Well, how do I get oil into my spirit? Well, you got to press your olives, which is literally thinking about the hope of salvation. And pray for complete revelation knowledge daily. Well, how do we know that? The Word of God says in the book of Psalms that you are an olive tree planted in the house of the Lord. And we know from the experience of Zechariah that <laughs> in the realm of the Spirit, there are olive trees in the tabernacle. Well, let's turn to it real quickly. <laughs> I think we're going to do a, a, a deeper study of this in the meat section of the Word. But just to let you know that all these Old Testament symbolisms have spiritual implications. I'm going to ask you, please turn to the book of Zechariah real quickly. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Zechariah chapter 4, and in verse 1. Then the angel who talked with me returned and wakened me as a man is wakened from his sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top of it, and seven lights on it, and the seven channels to the light. And also there are two olive trees by it, 
one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. And then in verse 14, verse 13, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said, he said, so he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. So people are going to be like olive trees pouring oil into the menorah over there. So there is something like that in the tabernacle of Moses, the spiritual tabernacle of Moses. And guess what? There is something like that applicable right now because you function in the tabernacle of Moses. And that's the reason the book of Psalms is going to say that we are olive trees planted in the house of the Lord. Now back during the tabernacle of Moses, especially through during their wilderness journeys, they didn't have the luxury of carrying trees all around through all the desert, carrying trees all around. They, they couldn't do that significantly. So God told them, well, just get an abundance of oil and bring it over. But technically, in the realm of the Spirit, you are planted right now, and you can drip oil into your menorah. Well, how did they used to get olive oil back in the Old Testament? you got to understand that olive oil came from olives which olives came from olive trees. So what they're going to do is they're going to pluck olives and they are going to start pressing those olives. And when they press those olives, oil is going to drip out of those olive fruits over there. Well, the word of God says in the book of Philippians, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul writes into the church in Philippi over there, that when I press, I get free will to move on right now. And thank God that Paul used the word press over there to let us know what's going on in the mind of the Spirit of God. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, not that I have already obtained all this, or I've already been made perfect, which perfect is talking about over there, is talking about the fullness of the stature, the capacity of Jesus. He's trying to get to that stature over there. He's not talking about perfect obedience. Perfect obedience is what you get right now at the moment and you sustain it. Now I understand it's important. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has, has taken hold of me. What is it pressing on to do? Back up to verse 10. I want you, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of sharing his suffering, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Is thinking about the hope of resurrection of the dead, the hope of immortality. And it says, as I think about that, I am pressing something. And when I press that, that is going to keep me motivated. So it means that pressing that is going to be similar to pressing olives in the Old Testament. And thank God for that revelation because it is true. The word of God says in the book of 1 John that he who has this hope in himself is going to be able to keep, keep himself pure even as he's pure. What's that hope? It's that revelation of immortality. The hope of the Christian calling. It's got to be really bright in you and you've got to think about it so that you can have oil in your menorah because that oil in your menorah is going to give you illumination so you can journey to the most holy place every morning and download the counsel of the Father for your story. So what is the, the oil within? How do you get it? You are going to pray for complete revelation knowledge every day. And the Holy Spirit is going to reward that exercise with the fruit of olives. Personal revelation of the hope of immortality. The Holy Spirit is going to reward you with that. Now, your personal revelation, your scripture, that the Holy Spirit connected to you, those are your olives over there. Now, it is your responsibility to, to, to press those olives every day. What does it mean by pressing? Paul talked about it. You've got to think about it. Think about that revelation, the personal revelation of immortality every day. As you do that, at least twice a day. And we have a prayer booklet that's going to remind you to do that when you get to that section of the booklet. You're going to press your olives and think about it. When you think about it, it's going to connect certain dots. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, that's what I'm oh. The process of doing that oil is flowing into your menorah. Real stuff. It's a resource. you got to conserve it. How do you monitor? Check your drive to carry on uh, with the hope of the Christian calling. 
Carry on with the disciplines, the yoke of the master right now for immortality. Hallelujah. Technically different from the spices. Willingness to fulfill the ministry of Jesus. That's how you're going to check your spices. But this one, the discipline of the master to fulfill immortality. When you start feeling like, well, this immortality stuff, I'm not really interested in it. Well, oil is getting low right now. The drive to fulfill the ministry of Jesus, to carry on with the disciplines of Jesus so he can enter into immortality. Oil is getting lower right now. So how do I how do I grow it? You gotta make sure you pray for complete revelation of the hope of the Christian calling every day, the hope of salvation every day, and think about it as God gives you revelation. And again, avoid God mischatting. Hallelujah. What about incense? That's the gaseous aspect I've been talking about right now. James chapter 5 and verse 16 says the effectual firm prayer of a righteous man is going to generate incense. And we know based on the evidence of Revelation chapter 5 that that is coming from the prayers of the saints of God. Revelation chapter 8 as well. What type of resource is this? It is an external resource. It's like gas. Numbers chapter 16 and verse 45 to 47. Moses describes the operation of incense over there. When wrath broke against the community, Moses told Aaron, quickly put incense in your censer and swing it toward the most of the place so that this wrath can stop. <laughs> Real stuff. Well, the same thing is going to be true in the New Testament as well. There is incense available when you pray. What's the, lo what's the location of this incense? The, the incense comes on your body. It comes on your soul. It comes, comes on your circumstances to give you the spiritual energy to obey God and to work the works of Jesus. It is required to do the greater works of Jesus based on Mark chapter 7 that we just read over there. Um, Yahushua talking about that in that story uh, where, where he healed the blind, uh, the deaf and the mute. How do you get incense on your body? You got to pray with all types of prayers. Exercise complete faith principles for the kingdom of God every day, including tongues and travail, and weekly for sanctification. All this deep exercise that we talked about. That's going to put incense on your body. How do you monitor it? How do I know if incense is low? Well, Jesus talked about you monitoring your peace. Based on Matthew chapter 10 in verse 13. Let's take a look at it real quickly. Very critical. When incense is getting low, there is going to be a loss of peace a little bit. Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 13. If the home you uh, if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. This is talking about how Jesus sends the disciples out. Because we know that he laid hands on those boys over there. He laid hands on them. says, receive incense, receive incense, receive incense. And he told them to go ahead and do the works that he did over there. But he said, the resource I placed on you is a finite resource, so you got to monitor it. If you go over there and there is no man of peace since a certain house, leave that place. Why? Because your incense is going to be dissipated over there. So how you monitor the dissipate of incense is that peace over there. You monitor that peace. There is no agitation in your mind. But when you start seeing your mind is getting agitated, well, maybe incense is low over there. You quickly go back and you gas up that incense. Bless the name of Jesus. Monitor peace. How do you grow it? You want to transmit incense to worthy vessels and replenish by tongues and travail Mark 7, 24 strategies that we talked about. Really important. Now, um, resource number five. Resource number five is going to be the anointing upon, which can grow to become the unlimited resource on Yahushua's body. Based on John chapter 3, verse 34 that we talked about, what type of resource it is, is it? It's a liquid, and it is external. It's placed on the physical body. Uh, it's a resource that describes that you have an open door with the Father, which is an indication of a growing righteousness quotient, uh, which I believe everybody has to some extent. Your door may be a quarter open right now, or half open, three quarters open, 
Well, we're going to get finally to the full open resource, <laughs> which uh, uh, the, the Church of Philadelphia had, which in fact, let's turn to that scripture, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia arise. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can help him. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Mark that. He said this only to the church in Philadelphia. He didn't say, say this to the church in Ephesus. They didn't have an open door resource in Ephesus. They didn't have an open door resource in Pergamum. They didn't have an open door resource in Laodicea. He said it to Philadelphia. Why? The answer is right in there. I know your deeds. You have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you've kept my commandment and endured patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have and see that nobody takes your crown. So it means that this open door resource is a crown. Well, how do you get a crown? James chapter 1 talked about that. Blessed is the person who endures trials because when they stood the test of time, they will obtain the crown of life, which God has promised to give those who love it. Well, the way you get that crown in the book of James is consistent with the way the church in Philadelphia, and actually the angel of the church in Philadelphia, because he's talking to one person over here. The, the way this pastor got his open door resource over there is going to be consistent with the strategy that the book of James talked about, about the grace of God. So how do you get this on your body? You get this on your body by growing actions of righteousness, which we call Dylan's for Podials in this ministry, passing the Father's fire tests of persecution and temptation and affliction. We talked about the story of Elijah over there, how Elisha followed Elijah from Gilgal to Bethel, from Bethel to Jericho, from Jericho to Jordan, to get growing measures of the anointed upon. Well, what Elijah finally got across the Jordan was the unlimited resource, double portion anointed. That's what he called it to Elijah. But it's important to realize that Elijah had been anointed prior to that Gilgal journey, Bethel journey experience over there. Because God told Elijah, go up, go to Elijah. When Elijah said, well, I'm tired of ministry right now, God told him, go ahead and anoint Jehu. Go read it back again in 2 Kings. Go anoint Jehu. Go anoint Elisha. Go anoint another person over there. So they carried some resources in there, but Elisha said, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to grow this thing. Well, if you want to grow it, come over. Come from Gilgal to Bethel, from Bethel to Jericho, from Jericho to Jordan. And we know those places are places of intense physical battles which will be representative of spiritual warfare that you go through as you endure the Father's fire test of persecution and overcoming, temptations and overcoming. God's going to place a resource on you because you're a tree of righteousness who's been wounded but healed right now. Isaiah chapter 61 talked about that. We talked about that before. In baptism into the Father's fire, we are not going to relieve that. Hallelujah. And this resource is the most expensive of all of them. So it is very, very important that you learn how to grow this resource. How do you monitor this resource? Proverbs chapter 28 tells us in verse 1 that the righteous will be as bold as a lion. But the wicked man is going to flee even if nobody's chasing him. You check your boldness level. That's how you monitor this resource. That boldness is going to come on you. And it's not because you're shouting so loudly. You're going to see that boldness. There's no fear over there. Glory to God. That fearless boldness is going to be growing in you if the anointing upon is growing on you. How do you lose it? You lose that anointing when you fall into treason. You lose some of it. And you have to go back and endure and overcome. God has to reorchestrate circumstances before he can get that crown line back on you. So you stay away from treason. Now if you want to stay away from treason, you're going to avoid the traditions of man. Or anything that can slide you down over there. 
and defer only to true greatness. We talked in detail about that in TOS 5, how Satan jerks believers into treason because of the traditions of man. And I'm going to read a story here in 2 Kings. I believe, uh, let's see right now, 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 30. Oh, this is one of the, one of the, one of the things that make me really fear God. Well, and I'm going to read that with you, that story right now. 1 Kings chapter 30. Yeah, we're going to go for this. I know this is kind of long, but it is important that we understand how to monitor all these resources right now by the grace of God. 1 Kings chapter 13, the story of a man of God from Judah. By the word of the Lord, a man of God came to Judah, came from Judah to Bethel. As Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering, he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, O altar, O altar. This is what the Lord says, a son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests of the high the priests of the high places will now make offerings here, and human bones will, will be born, burned on you. That same day the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. This altar will be split apart, and the ashes on it will be poured out. When King Jeroboam heard what well, the man of God cried out against um, the, the altar of Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Seize him. But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out. Uh, pour out according to the sign given by the man of God, by the word of the Lord. Then the king said to the man of God, Intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord, and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, Come home and eat with me. I have something to, have something to eat. I'll give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king, Even if you were to give me half of your possession, possessions, I will not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not return, you must not eat bread or drink water or return, or return by the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, now this is the critical part of it. <laughs> now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done here that day. They also told their father what he had said to the king. Their father asked him, which way did he go? And his sons showed him which way the man of God from Judah had taken so he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. And when they had saddled the donkey for him, he mounted on it and rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I have been told by the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that you may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. While they were eating and sitting at a table, sitting at a table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out to the man of God who come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and I have not kept the command of the Lord your God. The Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat and drink. 
Therefore your body will not be buried in the tombs of your fathers. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet, who had brought him back, saddled his donkey for him. And as he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown down on the road with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. Some people who passed by saw the body thrown down there with the lion standing beside the body. And, there, and they went and reported in the city where the whole prophet lived. When the prophet who had brought him back from his journey heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who defied the word of the Lord. The Lord has given him over to the lion, which has mauled him and killed him. That's the word of the Lord had warned him. The prophet said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me, and they did so. So he went and found the body thrown down on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside it. The lion had neither eaten the body nor mauled the donkey. Look at that. One of the really critical stories that make, makes me fear God when I read that. So here's this young prophet. He's going over and just doing his thing the way God's told him to do his thing. And he went over to Jeroboam and deliver, delivering the message of the Lord. And God told him, don't, don't stay over there. Make sure you go back over there. And he started going back innocently. And uh, here, all of a sudden, here comes this old prophet over there. This old prophet says, well, can't you see I'm a man of God as well? Come over to my seat. And then he went over to the, to, to the old prophet's house. And then the original word of the Lord came through that old prophet and said, well, you committed treason right now because you listened to me instead of listening to the Lord. And I started thinking about that ever since I saw that scripture. I said, God, this is really tough right now. What made the young prophet behave like this? To lose what he worked for. He lost his life, lost some anointing, he truncated his ministry. Why? Well, what made him do that? The thought process that made him do that was the traditions of man. And that's the reason I'm talking about this. And from the standpoint of this final resource right now that I'm reading to you, the anointing upon. You got to understand that God is not a respecter of persons. And he respects what I taught you guys in TOS 5 only true greatness. Now, true greatness is not a function of how old you are, how long you've been in ministry. You all don't know that. In TOS 5, we talked about that. True greatness is a function of this resource of the anointing upon. Well, how do you how do you know this resource, resource of the anointing upon? Well, the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13 talked about that. It says, consider the outcome of a ministry before you imitate their faith, before you defer to the one. Let's take a look at that. Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of, word of God to you. Consider the outcome of the way of their life and imitate their faith. So God's not just going to be telling you to defer to the judgment of an old prophet blindly. He says, consider the outcome of their way of life. Now, I talked to you guys that before in TOS 5, that you may not know the outcome, because, well, I, I, I don't live in their house, I don't know, but you are the outcome of their ministry. When a ministry, a certain ministry is talking to you, you check the impact of that on your ability to move in the direction of righteousness. If that ability is pushing you in the direction of righteousness, they are the truly greater than you, then you can imitate, you can defer to their judgment. But if, that, if that's not pushing you in the direction of righteousness, they are no longer the truly greater to you. You park them aside in love and carry on and do what God's called you to do. Do not be like the young prophet who's going to dock himself back under that old prophet. You may get mauled by a lion in that process of doing that. But the traditions of man will override all that. He said, after all, he's an old prophet. He's been prophesying before. You're going to lose what you're working for. Yahushua warns strictly against this. This is spiritual economics in here. This is strictly business over here. You conserve what you're working for. Oh, but I don't want people to hear this story because if they hear this story, they're not going to defer it to me. And maybe that's going to be good for you. Maybe that's going to be good if, you, if, you, if you're like a backslidden old prophet over there. God's not speaking to you anymore. People should listen to you. You've got to find out what you, where you missed and then the word of the Lord is going to come back to you and save you of your hairs. 
If I'm missing him, I'm backslidden or something like that, park me aside in love and move on with you, God. How would you do that? You exercise and practice HU6 and pray, pray for me. And then you move on with your God. Don't let some kind of lion come kill you because you listen to an old prophet when you shouldn't do what God told you to do. Traditions of man. Really important. Oh, yeah, but this tradition. Yeah. Jesus told his disciples. He says, be aware of the land of the Pharisees because of this thing over here. He told them that. Oh, he, he didn't have an attitude. <laughs> of the tradition of man to all the Pharisees. That's why you got to make sure you monitor. This is the most expensive of all these resources I'm talking about. The alarm upon. Your ability, your open door resource. Make sure you monitor it. And grow it by seizing opportunities to practice righteousness and gleaning on the incense, the complimentary incense that you're going to get from the truly greater. Make sure you're grossing you and don't lose it by the tradition of man. How do you monitor this resource? Check your boldness. How do you grow this resource? Pass the Father's fire test. Seize opportunities that demons and parties will, pre will present in front of you to grow your righteousness quotient and defer only to the truly greater. These are all the resources that a believer has access to. And it is spiritual economics when we use God's resources, any of those resources we talked about right now, for intended purposes so they can grow. You've got to understand in God's kingdom, resources multiply when they are used for intended purposes. If resources are not used for intended purposes, they will diminish. But when you use resources for intended purposes, they will grow. A good case is how Jesus, Jesus' righteousness caution grew when he gave incense to the Syrophoenician woman over there in Mark chapter 7 that we just read a few moments ago. So Yahushua's RQ grew because he, he operated in divine love toward that woman over there, healing her daughter. But even though incense was reduced temporarily as a result of that action of righteousness, but righteousness question is born right now. So the next time Jesus prayed, all he needed to do was a deep sigh into heaven and poof, incense came back on his body just like that. Jacked up righteousness portion, a great amount of incense is going to be generated because of that. And that's how you can grow it. Hallelujah. Avoid levels. Luke chapter 12 and Matthew chapter third, chapter 23. Jesus says, avoid the levels of the Pharisees. Why? So you do not lose what you're working for. Do not be like the prodigal son. Avoid the traditions of man. Young prophet versus old prophet. I just read to you a few moments ago. Spiritual economics is going to contrast with the Babylonian way of economics, which says that to increase, you have to amass selfishly and try to win at the expense of others. No, that's not the way things increase in God's kingdom. The word of God says in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Given is going to be given back to you. Cast your bread over many waters. Seed, time, and harvest shall not cease. That's how you grow. This resource is on you. Yahushua conserved leftovers. And he taught, he taught his disciples how to monitor the peace uh, over there. Why spiritual economics? Your body re requires the seed of Zoe in it to prepare for the next resurrection. Therefore, Zoe upon you must be conserved and must grow. The incense on you must grow as well. The anointing on you that you carry is a limited resource. Well, it can grow to become a limited resource. <laughs> but you got to make sure you don't waste it through the tradition of man. And I think this point is really important. Because before I drew the line in the sand, I made up my mind that I'm not just... If you guys are not going to move on, just, just I'm going to park you aside in love and I'm going to discover the true gospel by taking away the traditions and the strong gods in my, in my mind. I made that decision years ago because I'm, I'm working so hard. I'm praying the kingdom through. I've been praying the kingdom through for, since 1994 or something like that. I'm doing three, four hours of prayers every day. 
And I'm going to go over there and listen to this person. All of a sudden, I'm going to lose my incense like that. I try to help those people lose my, what is going on over here. Oh, I'm being baptized with infirmity. How do you know you're losing your incense? You get more confused over there. You're not able to have energy to resist sin like you should be resisting sin. You're getting baptized with infirmity. Oh, maybe they're not a truly greater anymore. Park them aside in love and carry on with your God. Do not be like that young prophet who's going to get killed because of the tradition of the man. Oh, but if I don't do that, if I don't, if I don't listen to them and all of that, well, God is not a respecter of persons. You've got to understand. He's not traditional. Well, they're going to call me rebellious. Who cares? They call Yahushua rebellious. And he is now the celebrated Savior, Messiah of the Lord. Carry on with your God. Why spiritual economics? We are not the author of Zoe. God is. And he, and he advocates sowing on good soil. You want to make sure that you do not transfer incense to somebody who has trees on the inside of it. We talked about that before. Last week. If you transfer incense, you may be to somebody who's got trees in on them. You may lose what you're working for like that. Yahushua, um, Paul says to Timothy, do not be hasty in leaning of hands. We talked about that last week. How do I give virtue without wasting it? You lay hands, you speak words only to people who are ready to receive. Therefore, challenge people to repent of their sins. If the Holy Spirit prompts you that there is treason somewhere, make sure you challenge them. Do not lay hands if the person hasn't repented of treason against God. Treason like the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, evil attitudes, and attitudes of unbelief, dishonor against the carrier of virtue, rebellion against God. Saying yes when God says and all those nasty things. Challenge people to repent of that before you try to transfer incense to them. Because if you transfer incense, you're going to lose that resource. And you're going to go back, have to go back and generate incense on you. If it didn't make you fall into treason, you haven't lost the anointing upon just yet. But you got to monitor all this. On the part of the person who will hand to lay, prevent wasted by quickly repenting of any treason and being single-minded and operating in faith. Tips to grow in virtue. Learn how to monitor the virtue contents of your physical body. We learn that from Jesus based on Luke chapter 8 and verse 46. He said the faith of a woman tapped into the virtue right now. And I perceive that virtue or incense flowed out of me. You've got to be that smart as well. How do you know if incense is flowing out of you? You're going to check that piece over there. That piece is going to get low a little bit. Well, that's not treason. It's not a loss of your joy. It's not a loss of the joy of your salvation just yet. No, no. Just go back and you do a deep sigh in heaven or something like that. And get that instance back in your body. Learn how to replenish with a consistent and complete operation of faith principles uh, for sanctification or KOG scriptures or something like that. Conserve what you've worked for. Do not dissipate power foolishly by fellowshipping with the carnal and the unbelieving. The carnal and the unbelieving are tools in the hands of Satan to steal your peace over there. Don't dissipate incense foolishly to them. You're going to lose energy to sustain the status of PO like that. Be wise in your dealing with them. Ensure that every speech of yours is seasoned with salt. Be willing to refresh good-hearted people because this is the way to mutual increase. Avoid contemporary idols relying on medical science and financial institution. Technology without consult, uh, consulting with your God. Consult with God firstly if something were to break or go and right in your circumstances. Because the word of God says, Cursed is the person who trusts in the heart of the flesh. If hands are laid um, and there is no answer, Check what is blocking the answer. Do not be like the Old Testament people who resorted to idolatry because God didn't answer. Imitate good examples and start asking questions. God's not pleased with something over there. Let's become spiritually economical. Let's become spiritually intelligent. Get all these things and start digging in between the lines and understand how Yahushua practiced spiritual economics by the grace of God and be an agent of virtue. Hallelujah. Glory to God, bless the name of Jesus to get something from it. Lean out of hands, part two is what I talked about today. 
I want to make sure that uh, my gift of view and audience who may not know the Lord Jesus. They haven't called Yahushua the Lord of their lives. So I want to give them an opportunity to do that. If you would like to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm going to ask you, please turn to Matthew chapter 7. This is the most complete salvation scripture I can find in my Bible, and I'm going to read it to you. You want to make heaven your home. When Jesus comes, you want to be eligible. Your journey is going to start from here. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. So that scripture, that passage of scripture captures holistically what it takes to make it over to the kingdom of heaven. Called Yahushua, Lord, live to please the Father. So you've got to start that journey today if you haven't done it before. Or if you've done it before, you're backsliding, you're not calling Jesus Lord, especially with your actions anymore. You want to recommit to call Jesus Lord, my brother, my sister, that invitation goes for you right now. Because the word of God, the true gospel, is the only gospel that makes sense. No other religion can lay claim to the fact that they have a living leader. But we know as followers of the Messiah, that the Messiah is alive. He got up from the grave. He's not in the grave anymore. So it makes logical sense to follow somebody who is still alive. He got up from the grave and he's telling us and he came back to teach us what life is going to be like on the other side of eternity. It's going to be a whole lot better than trying to follow somebody who's still in their grave and they can't come back to tell you what life is going to be like on the other side of eternity. I'm asking you, my brother, my sister, give your life over to Jesus. If you like it, if you're going to like to do that, you want to do that, please pray this prayer sincerely from your heart with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I realize that I've been a sinner, calling myself my Lord and my Master, living by my wits and powers. I repent of that sin. And I ask you, please forgive me. I call you Lord, Master, Boss, and Savior. Please save me. And help me to please the Father. From this moment forward, I am born again. And I thank you for saving me in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Glory to God. If you prayed that prayer with me, I want to say congratulations to you. Welcome to the family of God. You are born again and you are on your way to heaven. Come on board with the rest of us. We are going to do you good by the grace of God. All right. So if you prayed that prayer with me, so please go ahead and send us an email at inquiry at hearersmart.com. And we will like to share some resources with you so you can grow your faith in Christ Jesus and come on board with the rest of us. Well, there's a lot of things to learn. As you can tell, there's a lot of things to learn. And I understand. Do not be intimidated. We are going to journey together and bring the hero on the inside of you. Congratulations, my brothers, my sisters in the Lord. Welcome to the family of God. Hallelujah. All right. So for the rest of you, we may want to take a copy of the study notes on the board. Uh, you're trying to study along with us. You know, I'm talking really fast. I understand that. It's because there's a lot of content. And we only have just about 90 minutes to pour all this out. I want to step, a start, step, step aside from the screen for just a little bit to give us some time to take a snapshot of the study notes on the board. You're welcome to pause your device right now. Take a snapshot of that study notes and quickly um, uh, download it and then study along with us. Or better still, you can do everything from heroesmart.com. You are going to see a place over there where you can watch sermons and download and do that at your convenience over there. But anyway, if you don't have that time, you're watching on YouTube or something like that right now, quickly pause your device, take a snapshot of the study notes on the board, and I'll be back in 10 seconds.
bless the name of the Lord. I believe you got a chance to take a copy of the study notes on the board. So you can start to study along with us. I want to thank you for joining us today. This is Lane Out of Hands, Part 2, Spiritual Economics, 2021 ODP Milk Section Session on the Word of God. I want to thank you for joining us. I say be blessed in the name of Yahushua.